Well, grab your seats, everybody. Welcome to Fellowship Church. Thank you, Bam. Thank you, team. Uh, and yes, happy birthday to my wife, Diana Nepstad. And uh, this last week, we got to go to Magnolia Farms. Anybody like the fixer-upper? Well, Diana married one. <laughs> And uh, I love you for it. You, you've made me a better man. She's laughing a lot over here. It's true. I was a little rough when we got married, but she saw potential. <laughs> hey, my name is Sean Nepstad, and my wife and I have the great privilege and honor of pastoring this great group of people called Fellowship Church. And you know two words God gave us a long time ago. If you know them, shout them out with me, everybody. Come on. Hope and healing. Hope for tomorrow and healing from our... Where's that found? Come on, where's it found? We have all looked in different places, and we have all come to terms with it's found in Jesus, and I just want to let you know, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through today, Jesus is the answer to every equation. Last week, we started a brand new series, and y'all helped me preach real good last weekend, and I'm expecting you guys to be vocal and engaged and taking some good notes today, because we are in part two of this incredible series and I want to, first of all, draw your attention to a couple things that's happening on the calendar, okay? Here's what you need to know. First of all, Growth Track is today. You say, what's Growth Track? It's the front door of the church. So you can join the church today. And really, even if you're just like, I want to kick the tires of the church, let me hear about the vision, let me hear about the structure, that's all found in step one that happens today, the first weekend of every month. And it's happening on the other side of that wall, every service. So you can go to church and then go to Growth Track, or go to Growth Track and go to church, or you can come and visit Growth Track and do Growth Track online at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, all right? So, by the way, that is, that is the way that you get involved anywhere in the church. Am I clear? Y'all got it? Okay. And then first Wednesday is this Wednesday night. You don't want to miss that. It's going to be a lot of fun. We have Pastor Nicole Crank coming all the way from St. Louis, and she is a fire preacher. It's going to be amazing. Uh, get here early because you want to get a good seat. And then the intern preview night is happening May the 16th. We have our intern graduation. We have our college graduation coming up. We have a lot going on in May. And you don't want to miss a Sunday because I feel like this is going to help you in your progression of growing. Anybody grateful that you don't have to stay stagnant? Aren't you glad you can grow? And that's what I love about our church. No matter where you are on this spiritual journey, whether you haven't begun yet, you're just kind of checking this whole thing out, you're welcome here. Whether you just started, or whether you've been growing for years, we can always grow more. And you just have to be in the right environment, and have the right nutrients in order to grow. And that is the Word of God, and that's a life-giving church. And if everybody can just clap your hands and welcome everybody watching online. Wherever you're watching around the globe, we love you. Make sure you get plugged into a life-giving church in your local area, and I believe it's going to change your life. All right, you ready for this? Let's go back to our theme verse. You can take pictures of this. You can take notes from this. This is a verse found in Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus is talking to the people who want to follow him. So if anybody here is like, man, I want to follow Jesus, here's what he said. He's like, hey, to his followers, whoever wants to be my disciple, my intern, my follower, Here's what you do. You deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Say those three things out loud. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Now, this is important to note that on Instagram, you can follow somebody and then unfollow. Uh, you can follow somebody when you like them, and then when you don't want to follow them anymore, you just click unfollow. Okay, th that's not the type of following Jesus is requesting. He's saying, if you really want to be a disciple of mine, it's not about just church. It's not about just saying, I believe in God or I'm spiritual. Come on, California. It goes much deeper than that. It's we die to ourselves. And this is not about comfort. <laughs> this, is a, this is hard, okay? I, especially in America, because I know. Some people have thought that Christianity is all about comfort. Like, God just wants me comfortable. He just wants me. He gives me a pillow and tells me to lie down in green pastures. Isn't that what the Word of God says? Listen, following Jesus Christ, we take up a cross. We deny ourselves. It no longer is about us. We die to us, and we are now living 
for him and his purposes. Come on, clap your hands and say a good amen. And welcome to part two of our series that really is for us to understand that whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life, for me, Jesus says, you'll find it. Like if you're trying to save your life and trying to keep in the comfort zone, you, you're not going to find out what true life is about. It's laying it down for Jesus. He'll help you find it. All right, here's the sermon title, everybody. It's in the zone. In the zone. Somebody shout, in the zone. And, and you, you all see the word that's crossed out, correct? Shout out the word. Shout out the word. Oh, we love comfort. Oh, we love comfortable shoes, comfortable environments, comfortable clothes, comfortable beds. And we feel like maybe some preacher has promised us that we'll be comfortable for the rest of our life. And it's a sad day when we value comfort over our calling and the Great Commission. We have to take up our cross, follow Jesus. Now, he does bless you along the way. Don't make a mistake about that. He is a father that loves you unconditionally, but comfort is just not our top priority. We're going to make a difference in the world and, and understand that one day when we get to heaven, that will be eternal comfort. But just like my friend Joel Cave says, what if your discomfort leads to somebody else's eternal comfort? Are we willing to be made uncomfortable now for eternity to help other people get comfortable? I feel like this, this series the Lord gave me, I feel like the Lord has impressed upon my heart that perhaps unknowingly we have made comfort our God. Where we've elevated comfort above everything else. And if it's uncomfortable, we're not going to step in it. But, but here's, the, here's the whole thesis for the series. You ready for this? The whole thesis for the series, and may I remind you, for those that were here last week and those that are new, we're always told to step out of our comfort zone. Like, get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your comfort zone. Try new things. But what if your uncomfortable zone became your new comfort zone? You got to get in the zone. And so every single person who's ever been used by God has had to step out of their comfort zone. But your entire life has been made up of you widening your comfort zone. We went through this last week, but your mama's tummy was your first comfort zone and you got out. And then first grade and ki uh, kindergarten and, and sixth grade and ninth grade and 12th grade and college and a new job and a new church. All of this was outside of your comfort zone, but you widened your comfort zone. You expanded your comfort zone to now to the point where your new comfort zone was your uncomfortable zone, but you made it your new one. Okay, listen, listen to me, everybody. Comfort will keep you from the will of God. If, this is, if comfort is your main goal in life, and just realize, you can do that if you want to. Just realize you probably won't live in the will of God. You can live there if you want to, but if that's your main priority, he gives rest, he gives grace, there are seasons of great grace where God pours out of your life. I'm not saying that, but, but, but if this is your goal, then just be comfortable living outside of the will of God. Is this okay for a service? Okay, listen, um, I want to en encourage you that your life will make a difference the moment you surrender to God and you step out of your comfort zone. And honestly, the idol of our generation has become comfort. And that's prohibited so many people from stepping into their true purpose and true calling. So what we're doing over the last, last week and the next few weeks is we're doing a case study on people in the Bible who stepped out of their comfort zone into an uncomfortable zone, but made the uncomfortable zone their new comfort zone. You ready today? Come on, we ready to get to work? Okay, last week we talked about Moses. Today we're talking about a little guy in the Bible named Gideon. Oh, I love Gideon. He's found it all through the Bible, but he's found in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is called the faith chapter. Kind of like you heard of the Hall of Fame. This is the Hall of Faith. It has all these men and women in the Bible who had to step out of their comfort zone and they were used to do extraordinary things. First time I preached this, I was 13 years old. Preached my first sermon, guys, when I was 13 years old. Check this out. In a turquoise silk suit. My eighth grade graduation silk suit, baby. I, I was like, what should I wear? I'm wearing a silk suit because that's what you do when you preach your first sermon. Came up preaching like, I had like 35 pages of notes and they introduced me. Here, Sean Neff said everybody and it was quiet and all you heard was my pants switch. Walked up to the pulpit, preached, 
fumbled over the words, fumbled over names in the Bible. It was so awkward, but you gotta get that out of your system. The one thing that I walked away knowing and remembering from that very awkward first sermon was that God takes ordinary people who put their faith in him, who are willing to step out of their comfort zone, and he uses them to make history. He uses them to change the world. First time I heard this sermon was Dino Rizzo several years ago. It impacted me so much. And uh, I, want, I want to remind you today that as we're taking notes, start by saying and writing this down that Judges chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8 is where you find the story of Gideon. Here's what's taking place. Last week we talked about the people of God. They're in Israel or they're in Egypt and they are the people of God, but they're in slavery. It's interesting, they're the people of God, but they're in slavery. They cry out to God, and God sends a deliverer named Moses who sets his people free. 40 years later, you know the story, they go into the promised land. Okay, fast forward the tape now. Gideon is here. It's been several years living in the promised land. Watch this. And now because of their disobedience and their unbelief in God, they're not living in the promised land anymore. They have allowed all of the outside influences to dictate their belief system. So these people of God who were so gung-ho about God all of a sudden have opened themselves up to the world and now they have invited all these other false gods in and they're worshiping crazy stuff. They're worshiping rocks and poles and the earth and all these other things that they have allowed and then all of a sudden they have this, this area in their life that they've not surrendered to God and pretty soon what took place is that these people who were delivered from slavery into the promised land are no longer even living in the promised land. They have moved into the caves of the hills because there's an enemy called the Midianites. Say Midianites. They're the sworn enemies of God's people, and two or three times a year, they just come on down and steal everything, steal the food, they steal their wives, they steal their kids, and all of this, and they have forgotten God. It's crazy because in moments of hard times, we cry out to God. In moments of ease, we forget him. God's like, have you lost your mind? I'm the one that brought you out of Egypt. Have you forgotten what I've done for you? You know, when God does something and answers a prayer, it's so fresh, we're so grateful, and then six months later, we have forgotten him. Israel's commitment to God was up and down, up and down. It was a roller coaster of emotion, and they removed themselves from God's covering. They they removed themselves. God didn't just take them out and kick them out. They removed themselves from God's covering, And because of that, they were given over to the enemy, the Midianites, two or three times a year, taking everything that they had. It got so bad that they're living in caves and to the point where, how many know when it gets real bad, (laughs) you turn back to God. Like some people, it takes rock bottom to actually realize, I cannot do this by myself. Let me turn back to God to deliver me. Isn't it crazy? How many are grateful, though, that when we come back to God, he's the God of second chances? He's the God of another chance. Come on, clap your hands and thank God for his grace. As we turn to him, he hears you. No matter how far you've run, no matter how far you've gone, no matter what you've done, you have a God that when you whisper his name, I don't care if it's on a bar stool at three o'clock in the morning, when you come to your senses and realize I can't do this by myself, God will run to you again. That's what he did for them. He sent a prophet, he sent an angel, and he talks to the people. He's like, okay, guys, you're worshiping crazy stuff. If you repent, if you come back to me, if you, if you be authentic, if you're, if you're true to God, I will then establish you to be the people I've called you to be again. And it's just like us. Again, on bad days, we cry out to God. Oh, Jesus, help me out. He comes through, and pretty soon we're like, I got this, God. I'm good. I'll see you later, Lord. Like a lot later. Like Easter later. Here's a text. God comes to Gideon. 
he does not find a man that would look like a world changer. He finds a man gathering scraps, just trying to get a little food for his family. And this angel steps up and says, Gideon, you mighty, mighty warrior. And the guy's like, excuse me? Just, I'm on the backside of a McDonald's trying to get a little Happy Meal. Try to feed my family. You mighty warrior, you war-ready person. And he does not understand the weight of the calling that God is about to call him on. Matter of fact, what's sad is, this is where a lot of us find ourselves, Gideon was actually comfortable being outside of the will of God. We're talking about comfort zone. A lot of our comfort zone, we get comfortable living outside of the will of God. It's uncomfortable, but it's familiar. It's uncomfortable, but it's our normal. It's like we're, we're, we, got, we have become comfortable and accustomed to living without the blessing of God. And here he is, not comprehending what, what the Lord is saying. Get in, you mighty warrior, you, you, you mighty man of valor. He's like, excuse me, are you, are you talking to me? Don't you hate it when you're not sure if somebody's talking to you? Like way back in the day when cell phones first came out. I had a little, little Nokia cell phone, you know, the one you could play snake on. I'm talking about old school phone. And my daughter called me. I was out in public. My daughter called me. I answered the phone, saw the number, and I was like, hey, baby. And at that precise time, there was an elderly woman who walked in front of me. <laughs> and she turned and smiled. And I was like, oh, uh, I, I wouldn't talk to you. I was, it's my daughter on the phone, my daughter. That's Gideon. You mighty man of God, you mighty warrior. He's like, Excuse, who, you talking to me? And then the excuses start flowing like Moses. He's like, I, I'm, I, I don't think you, I, you must have butt dialed me. Like you, you don't have the right guy. If you knew me, you would know I'm like the least in my family and our family is the least of all the tribes. You don't have the right guy. How many know God never calls anybody on accident? He knows your number, and when he calls you, he calls you because he wants you, has a specific role for you to play in the kingdom, and like a piece of a puzzle, you won't fit anywhere else. He's, he's making excuses, and then he's like, God, could you, could, you, could you show me a sign? God shows him some signs. But let me tell you this. When you're not walking in a confident, trust relationship with God, it's hard to decipher his voice. You start asking for confirmations everywhere. Could you, could you show me a sign? Well, he shows him a sign, and then he gives him a new name. But the Lord said to him, peace. Which some of you need to get, grab a hold of this verse. Peace. Listen, listen. Don't be afraid. You're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there, and he called him Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is my... Hmm. Don't you love that? And for whatever situation you're walking through right now, peace. Don't be afraid. God's got you. God's got you. He inspires him. He's like, you got to get all the junk out of your life. Stop worshiping these false gods, these idols. Get all the stuff out, wrong stuff. So Gideon, he does something that's a little, it's a little crazy. He goes through the whole city and just starts knocking down idols. Like all the idols that the people of God has set up of false deities, he's like pushing them over. He's like, and when the people wake up, he did it at night because he was scared. When the people woke up, they were angry. It was like being teepeed, but worse. You come out of your house like, what in the world? People are all mad, like, what happened? Who did this? And somebody's like, I think Gideon did this. And they're like, we're going to punch Gideon in the mouth. And then Gideon's dad steps up and says, no, 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 no. Guys, listen, hold on, wait a second. This is not right. Like if Baal, that was one of the false gods. If Baal was God, he can handle himself, and apparently he can't. And that's when Gideon steps up and preaches a little bit. He's like, guys, come on. We need to return to God. Here we are, the people of God, who God delivered out of slavery into this promised land. We're not even living in the promised land. We're out here living in caves because of our disobedience. Let's repent. Let's turn back to God. Come on, everybody. And he rallies. They're clapping. And then all of a sudden, guess who shows up? The Midianites with like 135,000 people. That's a lot. Of, and Gideon's like, that, 
So what? That's enough. Enough is enough. You know, he's so pumped up. Enough. No more. You ain't taking my food. No more. How many know you don't mess with a man's food? Taking their kid. He's just like, I've had enough. Can I, let's rally. Woo, woo, woo. Can I get a woo, woo? Put your hands in, everybody. Enough is enough on three. One, two, three. Enough is enough. He turns to the guy. He's like, God, can I talk to you for a second? <laughs> so, that's a lot of people that just rolled in. They're rolling deep. Their, their, their chariots got hydraulics. I'm just a little nervous. I don't know what. He says, um, are you sure you called me? Like, um, can, how can I know that I know it was you, you know? Like, can we do a little? And he, he does something called a fleece. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the Bible, that's not an Old Navy fleece, okay? This is a lambskin fleece. He says, okay, God, just so I know it's you, can you do me a favor? Could you make, when I wake up in the morning, I'm gonna sleep. When I wake up in the morning, I would like the lambskin, the, the fleece, the fur, to be wet, but the ground all around to be dry. Can you do that? He goes to sleep, wakes up. Sure enough, fleece is wet, ground's dry. He's like, oh, great, we're going to war. I don't like the idea of being gouged. <clears throat> he says, okay, uh, that was cool. Uh, let's do one more, okay? <laughs> let's run it back. But this time, let's switch it up. Uh, last time we did fleece wet, ground dry. Let's do fleece dry, ground wet this time. Because that, that, I mean, that, if, I, if you do that, then I'll know that it's you. You know, if we're not, again, walking in a trust relationship with God, we can begin to ask God to do circus tricks to prove himself. We're so unfamiliar with his voice that when he speaks, we don't even know if it's him. Start questioning the voice of God. Then we're like, I need confirmation here. Okay, uh, if, you, if you made the alarm go off right now, I'll know it's you. Make the tea kettle go off. I'll know it. If the TV cuts on, I'll know it's you. God does it. And he realizes it's going down. This guy, I mean, he, he was asking for the two-factor authentication. <laughs> Please drive ground with grass. Chapter 7 opens up. Early in the morning, Jerob Baal, that is Gideon. The culture had so impacted the people of God, they're naming their sons after false gods. That's Gideon's name. Baal was one of the gods that they served. Gideon and all his men, they camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them. So they're, they're approaching 135,000 people. It's a lot of people in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. Okay, time out. <laughs> well, I, that doesn't even make sense, God. You have too many men. <laughs> you playing with me. That's not funny right now. Because he, he was able to gather 32,000 men. 32,000 versus 135,000. That doesn't make sense to say we have too many men. Are you with me? Here's what you're to do. Um, I can't deliver Midian into the hands, uh, your hands or Israel. Because here's what you would do. I know you. You would turn around and boast and brag and act like it, you did it. God says, I know how this works, Gideon. I've seen it before. I get you out of a situation. You turn around and forget me. Over and over and over. You cry out to me. I show up. I restore and rescue. And you turn around and forget me. Like if I let you go down there right now, there's a small chance you might pull off a win. And then you would high five everybody and act like you did it. We're not doing it that way. You have too many men. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to make an announcement. Okay, here, church announcement, everybody. Church announcement. Um, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave. So 22,000 people <laughs> left and only 10,000 remain. Can you imagine? Anybody afraid? Yeah, we're all afraid. We got 32,000 against 135,000. He's walking around. Like anybody, you look scared. You look scared. 
you, your lip is quivering. You just wet your pants. Y'all can go home if you, and, and they're like, 22,000 said, cool. I'm good. I, listen, I got a little something to do with the house. You know, I wasn't even mad at the meeting nights. I don't mind living in caves. I mean, it's a cool breeze up there. Don't even need AC. 22,000 people leave. He's, can you see Gideon trying to keep the 10,000, like the morale up? Like, it's okay. We got 10,000. It's okay. We didn't need them anyway. If they're going to leave, we don't need their doubt anyway. And, and let's go. What time is it? It's game time. What time is it? <laughs> and, then, and then the Lord says, there's still too many. What does that even mean? We got 10,000 people. They have 135,000. What do you mean we have too many people? Take them down to the water and I will thin them out for you there. We don't need a whole lot of thinning, God. You know, if I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. And the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as like a dog and then, and, and the, versus those who kneel down. Okay, so he's, he's, got this, he's got this system. He didn't tell the guys. 300 of them drank cupped hands. <laughs> Lapping like dog. All the rest were on their knees to drink. So what happens is the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I'll save you. And give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. He had 32,000, 22,000 bounce because they were afraid. And then 9,700. Can you imagine walking home? Hey, guys, what's going on? Well, 9,700 are going home. How come? Because they, they drank wrong. <laughs> like, what does that even mean? They drank wrong. We're, it's, it's a water break. Why does it matter how we drink the water? We got 300 men. 300 people. 300 people against 135,000 people. 135,000 versus 300 men. You ever wonder and question what God is doing sometimes? That's a lot of people. Like, I've been working out a little bit. I could probably take about four or five of you right now. If you rush, if this whole row rushes stage, I could probably take these four. <laughs> Nico might be able to take one. But listen, listen, listen. This is one to every 450 guys. 300 men, each of them would have to defeat 450. Are you seeing this? This does not make any sense. 450. I mean, this is, this is too much. 22,000 said, I'm not comfortable with the situation. I'm gonna go back to my comfort zone. By the way, when you refuse to step out of your comfort zone, you also miss out on the miracle. Hmm. Just save that. Here's what happened. <clears throat> they come to the camp, and the Lord says, Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the 300 men who took over the provisions and the trumpets of the others. So now they got two trumpets, or three trumpets. What are you going to do with so many trumpets? Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. During the night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up. Some of y'all need to get up. You've been laying down in your comfort zone for too long. The Lord's saying, get up. Go down against the camp because I'm going to give it into your hands. Watch this. <clears throat> now, Gideon, if you're afraid. I love how compassionate the Lord is. If you're afraid, uh, yeah, I am. Go down to the camp with your servant, Pura. Here's what would happen. Gideon would go down, and they'd sneak down to the camp. And then they heard two guards in the Midian army that were talking. It's in the middle of the night. And what happens was one guard's like, man, I couldn't sleep last night. I took melatonin. It didn't even work. I had this crazy dream, 
I had a dream that this big old cafeteria roll just kind of ran through our tent and our camp and killed everybody. And the other guy was like, oh, that's Gideon's army. The Bible says when Gideon heard that, he started to worship. He's in the bushes. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jaira, you are enough. Runs back up to the 300 men. He's like, oh, it's all now. It's all. I just got a third confirmation. It's going down. Come on, everybody. Let's go and take them out right now. But before he does that, he separates everybody. He's got 300, 300 men. We're going to separate into three groups. Okay, line up, line up. Just count them off. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, no, you're, no, I know you guys are friends. You're a two, he's a three. <laughs> separate three groups. And he gave everybody four things. He gave them a trumpet, a jar, a sword, and a torch. A trumpet, jar, sword, torch. You ever carried a bunch of stuff and you're like, what's all, this is too difficult. Like you're going to the beach you got your towel, you got a, your mom in law's chair, you got a cooler and a baby straw. It's just too much stuff. This is how they felt. Verse 17, watch this. <clears throat> watch me. Watch me. Watch me. Watch me. He told them, follow my lead. That's what good leaders do. Leaders lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly what I say. This is serious. 300 men against 135,000. When I and all you who are with me blow the trumpets, then from all around the camp, blow yours. And then shout. Why do you do this stuff? That's faith. It's out of their comfort zone. And now God can work. And say, for the Lord and for Gideon. And then the three companies blew their trumpets and smashed the jars Grasping the torches in their left hand and holding their right hands in the trump with the trumpets. There they were to blow the trumpets. They shouted, a sword for Gideon and the Lord. Can you imagine what's going on? This is a huge wake-up call to the Midianites. I mean, here they are. They sneak up. They're, 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 they're surrounding the camp. All of a sudden, they just start smashing jars and blowing trumpets. And the torches. Shoo, shoo. And they're screaming, ah! Have you ever been awakened in the middle of the night with a loud noise that disoriented, like you're disoriented? Happening one time, I was 11th grade, and um, it was Sacramento. Lived in Sacramento for a little bit, and uh, woke up in the middle of the night. My mom's Chrysler horn is going off in the garage. There's no reason. Nobody's pushing it. It's a malfunction, just a, it's, and it's not like a Honda horn, like, Chrysler, I, I wake up, I'm disoriented, I don't know what to do, I'm running in, I run into the garage, and it's even louder, just echoes of Congo, I start crying, I'm just, you know, you wake up, you're half asleep, this loud noise, I start crying, I don't know what it is, I think it's a rapture, I'm just, I'm crying. I come back in. My mom's like, what is it? We got to call the police. I call 911. I'm like, my, my mom's horn's going off. I don't even know what it is. Like, you got to come in. Send the brigade. Send SWAT. Help me. Lady's like, you know this is 911. It's an emergency. I know it's an emergency. You need to help me. Just, I don't. She's like, have you tried disconnecting the battery? No. That's a really good idea, though. I go back in, disconnect it. Just... I was so disoriented from a dead sleep. That's how these people felt. They wake up <laughs> and they start turning on each other. God caused confusion to come into the enemy's camp. Listen to me. Great strategy, God. We have basically a marching band with torches up against a war machine. And the war machine turns around and they're disoriented and they just start taking out each other. Comes out the tent, starts stabbing each other. Like this guy stabbing his cousin Billy, like, ah, 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 ah. they take out everybody and Gideon's army's not even in the camp. They think Gideon's army has in, infected the camp and infiltrated the camp. They're not. They're on the outskirts of the army just watching this whole thing. Torches. Whoosh, trumpets and they're screaming and they're playing this is all that's happening 
and the army takes out themselves. Don't you love it? How God can confuse the enemy. Now obviously this is a picture of our spiritual battle right now with the devil. The devil has tried to come and destroy your life, but you have a God who can confuse the plans of the devil. Gideon's army, they come down. There's only a few people left, they take care of them, and there's two princes, one's named Horeb, and one's named, uh, 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 let me go back to the names, I forgot the names. Got two names, oh yeah, Oreb and Zeb, which one means raven, and one means wolf. And they take them out, they send a message back to Midianites, and they say, don't you ever come in our land again. We're God's people, this is God's land. Don't mess with us, we're, de we're dedicated to God. How many know, how many know that when God moves, the power of God mixed with the obedience of man is powerful. And, and for years, they had been so intimidated by the enemy, they weren't even living in the, what God li had them living in because they were comfortable living outside of the promises of God. But in this moment, they stepped out of their comfort zone, back into their new uncomfortable zone, and made that new uncomfortable zone their comfort zone. Okay, listen, Gideon never would have saved the day had he not been willing to take a step outside his comfort zone. Let me give you a couple points. Number one, this is important. We're dependent on God. This is not a philosophy. This is not a pop psychology. This is not positive thinking. We are dependent on God. We cannot do this by ourselves. We need the Lord. And when we are dependent on God, when we, when we are not falling prey to the sin of self-sufficiency and self-dependence, but we're dependent on God, I'll tell you this, God can do more through us dependent on him even in times of lack. Gideon didn't have squat, and God showed up. Watch this, watch this. Sometimes God subtracts before he multiplies. I said sometimes God subtracts before he multiplies. L let me give you this equation. I felt like the Lord gave me this illustration to help you. 100 minus 50 times 1,000 is 50,000. Let me say it again. 100, at first glance, it looks like subtraction. 100 minus 50 times 1,000 equals 50,000. Can I suggest to somebody, don't stop halfway through God's equation. I know there's been some subtraction in your life. It's not over. Because you have a God who sometimes will subtract before he multiplies. Stay faithful in the equation. Stay faithful in the problem. Because you have a God who still knows how to multiply You look at, all through the Bible, God worked through subtraction. David and Goliath, David was like, I gotta subtract this army. He took off the very thing that everybody else had confidence in, and he, he beat the Goliath. 5,000 people need food. God fed them with less, a little boy's long John Silver lunch. <laughs> he could have rained down Wonder Bread from the sky. He didn't do that. He worked with less. I said he worked with less. Don't stop halfway through the equation. Are y'all getting this? Like, let's not forget and let's not replace God with any idol, with any ideal, with any philosophy, with any blog, with anything else. There is no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. The name of Jesus Christ. It's not God and someone else, or God and another philosopher, or God and a psychic, or God and the stars. Listen, why would I contact somebody to tell me what the stars are saying when I can just talk to the God who created the stars? <clears throat> number three. God's not afraid of the numbers. The, the numbers don't scare God. We only got 300. God was like, and? 300 and me is always the majority, God's like. Listen, he's never intimidated by the odds. 300, we are better off with 300 and God than 100 or 32,000 and self-sufficiency. This may look like less, but God always delivers more when we're submitted to him. And the facts, listen, some of you are like, but the facts, but the facts. 
Some of you are drowning in the facts. The facts always look bad. But God's not limited to the facts. He steps into the facts. Steps over the facts. Matter of fact, the facts actually make for a great story. Now, um, number four. I got to hurry. I got so much. God can still use you when you're submitted to him and when you step out of your comfort zone. The 22,000 that left, remember, remember the 22,000 that left, how do you think they felt when the 300 came back saying, look what the Lord has done. You should have been there, but y'all left. I hope I remember some of these statements for next service, because this is good. <laughs> I'm giving y'all stuff that's not even in my notes. It's just. It would be nice to schedule spiritual battles, wouldn't it? Like, hey, the devil's like, hey, I'm going to attack you at Wednesday at 3.30. Mm, doesn't really work for me. How about uh, Thursday at 7? <clears throat> I'm going to be with my small group and then bring it on devil. Got my prayer team. I don't know to fast that day. Sometimes it's out of the blue. That's why you need a small group. That's why you need to be ready in season and out of season. Some of you, though, are walking around because you are so consumed with the facts, you're defeated and the battle hasn't even started yet. You're giving up on the marriage, you're giving up on life, you're giving up on your job and the dream and the calling because you're only focused on the facts instead of focusing on who God is. So allow me just to shift the focus today. And just like those 9,700 people, they're drinking. Gideon's like, well, you guys are cut. <laughs> Why? We're not at a water park, guys. It's a battle. Any moment, the enemy can come on. I need, I need some people to just keep your head up. Some of you are walking around so defeated, so overwhelmed, thinking it's drowning, the whole ship's going down, the ship of my marriage, the ship of my, 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 my family, the ship is going down. Listen, you need to get your head up. Look above the circumstances. We have a God, but you, Lord, are a shield about me. You're my glory, and you are the one that lifts my head. Oh, I wish I had a couple people in here that are grateful to God that you don't have to walk around hanging your head low in defeat. We're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from a place of victory in your life, your marriage, your family. You serve a God who is still greater. Grab your seats, grab your seats. I feel that there are more Gideons in this room and watching that are going to rise up. God's going to use you to save the day. And when we're done, we're not going to look at any human being and say, it was because of them. It was because of God. He gets the glory. But he's waiting for people who don't look like much to simply put their faith back in God and are willing to get out of their comfort zone. Take a step. Take a step. I know God's dividing this sermon into a whole bit, bunch of different ways. Why don't you just ask, God, what are you saying to me right now? <clears throat> your head's bowed and your eyes closed. I know all of us are going through different things. Isn't it great, though, we have, <laughs> we have one God who is the answer to all that we need. Now, for some of us, we might have been going to other places to try and find answers. 
that's you, this is the time, just like Gideon, to repent, turn back to God. Others of you, you might say, man, I've never given my life to Jesus. I've never surrendered the controls of my life to the Lord. What do I do? I want to lead you in a commitment prayer. But you can pray right where you are. You don't have to stand. You don't have to come to the front. But if this is you, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and just say, count me in that prayer, Sean, when you pray it. But before I do that, just ask again, what's God saying to me? For some of you, he's telling you, take a step Get in the growth track like today, like next service. Take a step. Join the team. Don't be one who's on the outskirts watching everybody step out of their comfort zone and God use them to work miracles. And then we are left out. God's building an army not to fight anybody physically, but there's a spiritual battle that's going on. And for some of you, you just need to re-enlist into the army of the Lord and just tell them, God, I'm in. I'm in, I'm yours, and I'm stepping out of my comfort zone. I want to get in the zone to make the biggest difference of my life. All right, let's pray. First of all, God, I thank you for your grace and thank you for your word. <clears throat> Thank you for these average human beings in the Bible who you use to do crazy stuff. I don't understand it. But it gives me hope because I feel average. I know a lot of us feel average, feel like regular people. We can't do this on our own. So Lord, we just come to you. We ask you, would you use us? Use us in, in your miracle story. We want to save some people's lives. We want to rescue some hurting. We want to stand up for people. Could you use me? Could you, could you use us? And Lord, we'll be faithful to give you all the praise, all the glory. If this is you. You say, Sean, I need to give my life to Jesus, or I need to rededicate my life to the Lord. I've strayed a little bit. I want to give my life back to him. On the count of three, raise your hand. Watching online, right here in this room. Come on, one, two, Three, just lift it up and leave it up wherever you are. This is me. Yes, 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 yes. Great job. I know many online too. All right, pray this out with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me first. Today I give you my life. Forgive me from my sin. Wash me clean. I repent and I turn to you. Now fill my life with your grace and love. Use me to make the biggest difference I can. I'm stepping out of my comfort zone and I'm getting in the zone. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.